Welcome to the Manifestation Bay podcast. My name is Katherine Zinkina, and I'm a manifestation expert, master mindset coach, and multiple seven-figure entrepreneur. I'm obsessed with helping you achieve everything that you once thought was impossible. If you're looking to massively up-level your life, your finances, your relationships, your productivity and success, then you have come to the right place. My goal on this podcast is to help you see the infinite potential within yourself to be, do, and have anything that your heart desires. Think of this podcast as your weekly dose of mindset development to help you maximize who you are and where you're going. Leave it to me to provide you with the tools, the resources, the strategies, and teachings that you need to manifest a reality wilder than your wildest dreams. I know we're about to have so much fun together, so thank you so much for pushing play today, and now let's begin. Hello, gorgeous souls, and welcome back to the Manifestation Bay podcast. I am including a super short intro today. In fact, I almost forgot to record this intro, and then as I was about to send the episode to my team, I was like, oh shit, I need an intro because we just got right into it. Um, This episode is a longer one. It's super in-depth, and we go into all about, you guessed it, I'm sure from the title, there's a reason why you clicked on it, building wealth outside of your business and outside of your career. We are talking all about investments in this podcast episode and how to get started building a portfolio. So to accomplish this feat, I decided to invite my husband onto the podcast so that he can share his wisdom and expertise with you on exactly how to get started with your very first investment Plus all other questions that you guys asked me on my Instagram, which there were a ton. I asked Brendan as many as possible. And some of them include, you know, his thoughts on crypto and Bitcoin and all of that jazz. So if this episode speaks to you and you definitely know that you want to learn more, Brendan actually teaches an entire investments course inside of the Manifestation Babe Academy called Make Money Work For You. And it's included absolutely free as a bonus to your enrollment. So if you want to get on the wait list for that right now to make sure that you don't miss our August launch and you'll be the first one to know about the dates for the August launch, that's manifestationbabeacademy.com. I'm also going to put the link in the show notes, um, but if you just want to type it out right now, do that super quick before you forget and then come back to this episode. Just go to manifestationbabeacademy.com. Okay. I'm not going to make you wait any longer for all the juicy stuff that Brennan is going to go into, into this episode. So let's just dive right in. Enjoy. Well, hello, my love. Hi there. And welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm back on the show. (laughs) Why are we so weird? I made it to the show. Right off the bat, we're weird. But this is, this is us, you guys. I don't think we ever really show our true personalities before in the past on the podcast. So we literally are just going to be ourselves. So I hope you're cool with that. I'm sure you're cool with that. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to bring Brennan to the show today. I don't know why I keep saying show. I've never said show until today. Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. So I posted a post uh, yesterday on my stories and I asked, Because I was, I've been looking for a topic to talk about because I'm dedicated to posting at least an episode a week. And so I looked at my calendar while we're in Greece and I saw that there is an episode that I know for sure is not going to come out in time towards the end. And I was like, guys, what do you want me to talk about? And a bunch of you asked for wealth building tips and tricks. And I'm not the right person to do that. I'm very good at manifesting money, but we have promoted Brennan King O'Keefe, my husband, to, I call him the money man, about a couple years ago, and he has completely transformed our investment account, just our wealth in general. Like He is the one who actually created a net worth for us while I created the income, if that makes sense. So he's made some really smart decisions. He's had a lot of fun with this. He's really passionate about this. So I decided to instead just focus on this topic, ask you guys um, what your questions are. And then Brennan and I did not even prepare for this podcast. He has no idea what I'm asking him, which is even more exciting. So we're just going to dive in to the world of money. Are you excited? 
as prepared as I could possibly be. <laughs> We're literally in our pajamas right now. Um, okay. So Brennan, why first and foremost, like, can you give a little bit of context as to why you're so passionate about this topic? Because I, there's two things that you're passionate about that I can see that when you talk about them, it's like you light the frick up and it's wealth building investments and real estate. Yep. So I know you're excited about this topic. Mm-hmm. Why are you so passionate about it? Um, it's a game. It's a puzzle to me. Um, I love the the process of looking at the world and looking at opportunities. And so for me, it's really like it's like research, right? It's like it's like research and running a game where you're running different tests and you're trying to think about what the world will look like in five years, in ten years, in fifty years. It's about Uh, finding people and opportunities that really get you excited. You know, when you come across something, you've, you, you're in school or or you learn something and all of a sudden you just, it doesn't feel like you have to, you're like, ah, yes. And like 95% of what you have to do, you're like, ah, screw this. But the 5% that you get really lit up by is like, I get to do this. I'm so excited. It doesn't feel like work. That's the way I see, um, the game of creating wealth. But for me, and I, I, I'm i sure we'll get into this later in this episode, it's actually not about the money. Because the money, when it even grows, you become desensitized to it. There's no amount of money. There's no um, number or fixed amount where you're going to end up feeling like, oh my God, I feel so excited by the money. For me, it's the game. It's the- Can I share a quick question? Because you said desensitize and I just want to share a funny little story that happened this morning before yeah. we keep going. So I walked in for my Soul Cycle class this morning and I walk in and Bren, um, Brennan, Leia is as always super excited to see me. And Brennan, of course, he's sitting on the couch. I see him and he's like not looking at me. He's like barely acknowledging my presence. And I'm like, what the fuck, man? You're not going to say Hi. And he's like so seriously looking at his computer, like typing away. And he's like, Catherine, sorry, I'm just trying to transfer to a quarter of a million dollars into our investment account. And like the way that he said it was like, sorry, babe, I'm just trying to order a coffee this morning. Like I'm really focused on ordering a coffee or just sending a text message. It's like no big deal. A quarter of a million dollars just being wired into our investment portfolio. And I can attest that it's become like this very uh, just just something that you do now. It's like a part of your life. Yeah, it is. It's again, um, you know, the amounts have changed over time. And um, <clears throat> if you are a student of Catherine's and you're inside, uh, you know, the Manifestation MBA, Academy, baby. yeah, inside MBA, um, uh, you not only have access to some of the teaching that I've done, but also uh, potentially an update on the way. So keep posted for that. Um, that's not even released yet. Now the whole world knows. So sorry, team. Um, but I just wanted to share, um, you know, we didn't always have that. This is, this is not these amounts and these volumes, um, uh, have changed a lot in a very short period of time. Um, just a few years ago, we had $0 invested and we're spending a lot of money to sit in rooms to talk about investing. Yeah. Can we rewind for just a second? Yes. Like, can we talk about how you got into this in the first place? Like you didn't come out of the womb like this. Not at What was your all. start? I think I was always interested in, um, I was always intrigued by the idea element of investments, like really smart people creating solutions that add value to the world. And the money coming from that is just representative of the value being created for people. Like oftentimes I hear people critique Amazon and Amazon has its own problems. Don't get me wrong. Um, there's many things that I think Amazon will have to evolve, um, as every business does in order to survive. But when people get really mad at Amazon, I giggle because to me, I want to first ask, like, how much money have you spent in the last year on Amazon? Why do you buy Amazon? Well, you buy Amazon because it's faster than anyone and it's cheaper than anyone, right? And so because it's faster and cheaper, it adds value to your life in a way that no other company is. And that's why they're so successful, right? So I love that that value add creating the money that we that people just see the money. But for me, it's the game of where can I find value add in the world? Where can I be in front of it? Where can I be the first in or the fifth in and kind of 
make sure I am putting a flag in the areas that are going to create value for the world, not that have created value in the past, but that will create value going forward. So that's really like I when I think about what lights me up about it, that's the piece where I got started is I obviously studied finance in school. And I, I you know, I worked in finance for a little bit when I was when I was young, uh, when I met Catherine. You're still um, young, babe. Well, I am still very young, but <laughs> you know, young. <laughs> as we grew the business, as Catherine really began to grow and I took on more of a role in manifestation, babe, for years, um, you know, the money was coming in, but we weren't actually creating net worth in our lives. Can you share a little, can we just talk quickly about how, you know, in the social media space and the business space, the online business space, which is what we're in, which is amazing. Um, a lot of people glorify like revenue and yeah. not many people talk about profit. Yeah. But we take it one step deeper than that. Of course, profit is really what matters, you guys. Like revenue yes. is cool. If you're making 100000 a month, like that is just, I mean, that is unbelievable money for so many people. But if 10, you are- 10000 a month is life-changing right, money for but people. Let me just, I like to use big numbers, clearly, because I'm a big <laughs> dreamer. So let's say you make hundred grand a month and you, you're you spending, your expenses are 99 grand a month, right? You're only profiting $1,000. Like, yeah, it's amazing that $100,000 is entering your account. But if 99 is leaving, it's like, do you really have the business of your dream? So I think that not enough people talk about profit, but also deeper than that, not many people talk about net worth. And net worth is something that is so like exciting to me and personally lights me up. And what Brennan has done is he has created essentially like what he calls a second business outside of our business. So when I say, you know, we have a multi-million dollar business, yes, we have a multi-million dollar business, but we're also multi-millionaires. And a lot of people don't know because it's it's so easy to be like, oh my God, I made two million last year. So therefore I'm a multi-millionaire now. Well, I look at that title as actually it's your net worth that makes you a multimillionaire versus having a multi-million dollar business. Like there's a difference between that. And I, you know, clearly did not know that difference when I was starting out and whatever. And the title doesn't matter, but it's just really cool to have something called a personal net worth. And that is your business outside of your business. That's the real certainty, security um, that will give you the, the money that will set you up for the rest of your life. That if your business goes one day, right, you're okay because you have money literally working for you. And that's what you called your course to make money work for you, yes. which I really love that. Cause it's so true. Yeah. So, you know, when I, when I look at, um, some of the things that we did, we took a very unconventional route and it worked incredibly well for us. But I also, I think I would advise people who are in our shoes early on potentially to be a little bit more intentional and thoughtful. So for those of you who know, you know, we've had a number of cars, but one of the cars, actually, we just bought this car, but, uh, is an Audi R8 and it's a rare Audi R8. Um, and we've had it for three years and we just decided to buy it. Um, and at the time we, we were leased leasing it. it before. Yeah, exactly. At the time we leased it. And when we leased it, it was a significant like asset to take on. We had made a lot of money. Depreciating in terms of, asset. Exactly. Let's, let's be very clear. <laughs> a depreciating asset. And when you lease it, there are benefits to leases. Do not get me wrong on that. I personally Le love leasing. I hate buying cars, but leases going. are not for everyone. I'm going to challenge you on that. <laughs> Catherine likes leasing because she I wants the new leasing. shit all the time. Yep. But the reality is, is that owning a car retains the value. Leasing it, you just give it up. Right. So there are benefits to each. And I would challenge anyone that says you should only buy a car or that you should only lease a car. I would challenge both of those and say, where are your blind spots? That's going to be an important thing when you're talking about investments and talking about creating money. Where are my blind spots in business, in life, in money, in my relationships? Blind spots are everything. If you can't see them, you are flying blind. But to circle back, um, you know, we got this R8 that cost a lot. And we did a lot of things that cost a lot. We traveled a lot. We did a lot of these things. And in our business, in Catherine's business, um, a lot of those things ended up having a really positive ROI or return on investment. It's an energetic, I look at it as an energetic investment. That's not what we're talking about on this podcast, by the way. When most of my episodes, when I talk about money, I'm talking about the energetics of money. So Brennan is here to really talk about like the physical, like 3D 
as fuck world, like the most 3D that you can get of like, this is what you actually do with the paper or the numbers in your bank account that come in. But all there's certain things that we've done in our life. Like a lot of people ask, like, why don't you own real estate yet? Why haven't you bought a house? Why do you rent a house? Like there's all these reasons that we have for everything. Um, obviously like Brennan can explain cause there's a lot of questions you guys asked. Um, but you know, like the, the car, the R8 was something that I got in a download of like, Catherine, you need this because it's going to radically upgrade your life. And it increased, of course, our income because the energetics of money, that's how it works. So increased our income and then gave us even more opportunities to then focus on actual, like tangible, physical investments that aren't depreciating assets. And so, you know, when we fly first class, which we don't always do, we sometimes make decisions about these things. When I we love moved in, first class. When we moved into our different apartments, our last one as well as this one, all of these things that we did together, um, we made decisions about whether we wanted this was a decision from wealthy now or wealthy later. And I don't want to get to explain in, that. I'm going to get into it. Let, let's let's keep on <laughs> track so here. Much we, we are just blabbling right now. So um, what I wanted to say about the cars is that the investments that we made were great in our business for the energetics. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that we did not do a great job of thinking into the future at the time. So if I were to mentor to coach my younger self, Instead of sitting in a room with Tony Robbins three years ago and 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 realizing that we had made all of this money and that we had spent a lot of it investing in our team, Be investing in specific, our business. We were at Tony Robbins financial trip, like the platinum partner trip, because that's because some people can be like, I went to UPW. What are you guys talking about? I never learned any of this. We went to he calls a billionaire boot camp where he literally invites, not only are there billionaires, actually, they're also learning, which I think is so cool. I mean, talk about being a beginner's mindset. That's something I aspire to be always as a beginner um, at everything that I do and just never have my ego be like, oh, I know everything. I don't need this. There's also 100 millionaires. Brennan befriended one of the 100 millionaires, had lunch with him in LA when he visited. And there's some like fun stuff that I'll have Brennan share, like part of that conversation. Um, because he's done it all. He's literally made all kinds of investments. And he's like, listen, this is literally, if I could do it over again, I would go back in time and do it this way. And I would still have the same amount of money. Um, and so, yeah. And so Tony Robbins brings in like the best of the best of the best people. And at this time we had $0 invested. And it's funny because Brennan was in that room feeling shame. Yes. Right. Shame and I'm in the room sandwich. feeling like the biggest badass that ever walked into that room because I'm like, I didn't care that we didn't have money invested. I didn't even know half the shit that they were saying. I had no idea what language they were using. I'm like, this is this is like coming in and into a room that's speaking Chinese or Japanese or Korean or whatever, like Polish or any language. And I have no idea what's being said right now. Uh, Brennan, of course, knew a lot. And he was like feeling shame of like, oh, my God, I feel so behind. We're so behind. We made 600000 last year. We have zero dollars of that invested. And I'm like, oh, my God, we have the whole future ahead of us. This is so freaking cool. You and I were what? How old were we? Like. 28, like 25, three years ago. Yeah, I think. I don't know. Yeah. And so it's so funny how we had different experiences, but I just want to be super clear that that was a platinum partner financial trip. It's not like a typical Tony Robbins event. No, it's not. It's not a typical Tony Robbins event. And that room shifted me in many ways. But I think when I look back at, you know, our journey, I would say some of the mentoring I would do to myself, what my higher self would tell um, the individual in those rooms is, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. You're not behind. You're on the right path. Let's be more thoughtful. Let's start earlier. Let's continue to build and grow faster. Those are the kind of positive reinforcing things I would have told myself because a lot of you maybe don't have any money invested and you're saying, oh, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn this off. Like, let's find a different podcast. <laughs> Let me feel good talking I'm about. I'm too late. I'm too late. I'm too young. I don't make enough money. I'm too stupid. I mean, we can all come up with excuses. There's a million examples 
Um, the cool thing about investments is that everyone can win. And my personal belief, and I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not a financial professional. Yeah. Disclaimer, this is just Brennan's opinion from his research experience, having financial fiduciaries that he works with and all that stuff. I am certainly human and I am certainly prone to making mistakes and I've made them before. And so nothing I'm giving uh, qualifies as investment advice in any regard. However, um, what I will say is... Um, you know, a, a lot of people get caught in the shame. They get stuck with their feet in the shame of not having started or having made a bad decision or. Especially if you have a lot of debt right now, because guess what? When we started this journey, Brennan had what, 50, $60,000 in loans, Fifty, yeah. $50,000 in student loans that you actually like, it, it kind of fucked up your credit score because you didn't have a job for like a year. And yeah. I don't know what the terminology is um, when you don't pay your student loans for a couple months, but or maybe it was like a year, whatever. It doesn't matter. And I had twenty five thousand dollars in debt when I started. So I know there's some of you out there. I don't care how much debt you have, two hundred, three hundred thousand, a million dollars. Like, who cares? It is not too late. And we'll, of course, speak on like because this came up in the, um, the course, like if I have a lot of debt, do I pay it off first or do I invest first? So we're going to get into all of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm just gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Go for it. Rapid because fire. I have I have some that I wrote down for like my must asks. Okay. Um, and then I have like a gazillion in here, and I'm just okay. gonna spit things out and okay. just be yourself, be honest. You can do this. <laughs> uh, first of all, what have you done with our money so far? Uh, because we just painted a picture of how we started with zero invested three years ago. Yeah, sure. Sure. You don't have to share like specific numbers, of course, whatever of course. you're comfortable with. So we have a... But I just want to make it clear that all credit goes to you. Like I have no freaking part in this. I am well aware of what Brennan's doing. He updates me every single day, a little too many updates sometimes, but I'm well aware of what's going on. I understand the terminology, all that stuff. So if you are in a, in a relationship and maybe you are, um, you know, your partner is the one who is in the investment field and makes the money and all this stuff... I want to encourage each and every single one of you, even if you're just the one who um, maybe you're a stay at home mom or whatever. Like, I want you to make sure that you are getting involved and you're asking questions and you're listening and you know what the fuck is going on. That is very important for your money relationship. You are an owner in your life. Yes. You need to be an owner in your finances, in your relationship with your kids. You have to take an ownership role in everything. I'll tell you this about the world. No one's going to do it for you. No one's going to fix you. No one's coming to save you. Mm -hmm. You have to be an owner in this regard. And I hope that this conversation inspires and offers an opportunity to realize that nothing's too late. No one's behind. And at the end of the day, all it takes is a little bit of courage a little bit of a deep breath, and then to start mapping what that future can look like and then gaining the information and knowledge because I'm telling you, that's exactly what I did. And that's what most of the people I see in the world who are really successful, yeah. that's what they did. Brennan is helping people who are in their early 20s and also helping my mom who's 47 right now. She's basically starting over her life. She just um, finalized her divorce. So she's starting fresh and she's like, Brennan, what bank account do I get? What are the best credit cards right now? Where do I put my money? Like she's starting all over you guys. So it's never, ever, ever too late. But OK, let's not avoid the question. We started with zero. And then what happened? <laughs> um, so we uh, we had we spent some time with some very influential um, uh, in, in a very influential network. That was the Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership Group. I feel just like via osmosis, it built a desire and a hunger in me to take uh, aggressive advantage of the income that we were creating in the business. For context, Manifestation Babe is now, you know, generated well over $10 million um, in the lifetime Total. of the business. Yeah. Um, but again, let's to go back to Catherine's point, which is a really great point. That is gross. That is yeah. not profit. That's not the. That's not after taxes. That's not. We live in California. Yes, taxes are extremely taxes, high. Guys, that takes um, out of your profit. <laughs> um, taxes. We pay our team really well. Um, in, in our opinion, we're very, well. Actually, we're very proud of the way mm -hmm. that we compensate our team. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the industry um, has a different perception of how to do our that. Our team is our we, family. We do it differently here. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I say over 10 million. So maybe, you know, uh, you're thinking, oh, well, they must have seven, eight, nine. Nope. <laughs> you have nope. not run a business long enough to know that yet. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. We really invest into our business. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
So we have a, a net worth now, a liquid net worth in the um, mid uh, seven figures. Um, and uh, that has you know, grown really quickly. Um, and I want to get into a number of those things. If the question comes up about the economy and inflation and all yes. these different things, I'd love to talk about that. But, um, you know, our investment philosophy is really simple. We work with a fiduciary. Um, they're partners at creative planning. Um, if anyone, maybe we'll link, you know, a description of creative planning, um, yeah, we'll somewhere, link, we'll link them. Yeah. Somewhere. We'll link whatever so you, we use all that stuff. Just, just remember we're not the professionals, So mm -hmm. don't make any decisions based off of what we say. Always do your research, always think for yourself and always consult with people who are like certified professionals. And we're not affiliated with any way other than nope. the personal relationships that we've had. Yeah, with, zero with dollars. So um, anyway, creative planning is a, um, they're a, an RIA, which is a registered investment advisor is the, is the title and they have a different, um, uh, methodology, but also they're fiduciaries. So they're not allowed to be brokers, meaning that they can't profit on either side of the deal as governed by law. You need to share the difference between the two. Cause I didn't know this. It's not something that I really want to get into hugely in this podcast. Cause it's very nuanced, but essentially, um, like a real estate agent, right? When they sell a home, they get a commission on that home. Well, the same thing is true in securities or in investing. Fees matter. Fees matter big time. And there's fees on what you buy and there's fees for who you buy it from. Uh, the idea and the methodology behind creative planning is that we pay a certain flat amount to them every single month, quarter, year as a percentage of our portfolio. Why do I like that? Would some people say that's expensive? Yes. We don't like that word expensive. I see nope. it as a thoughtful <laughs> investment because now e my team is bought in in growing my portfolio because when they get basis points, meaning a small fraction of that portfolio, now they're incentivized to grow it. They're not incentivized to turn it over and to trade things and to sell things and buy things and try to be the smartest person in the room when almost all of the investment research shows that people who think they're the smartest in the room and act that way in investments always underperform the market. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. Um, I wanted to say most of our investing strategy is based upon using um, highly liquid um, vehicles called ETFs. You guys have probably heard a lot about that. They're called exchange traded funds. There's a lot of people have never heard anything. They haven't even started. So like Explain so, as much as possible, please. Sure thing. This is investments for dummies. So there's a lot of pieces to this. Um, and uh, I could record 14 hours on this for you. We but might have to do. So if you guys can give us feedback, like actually go out of your way and like send Brennan a DM. Um, he's no, 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 no. Send our team an email. Okay. okay yeah. yeah. I, I keep forgetting. We have boundaries now. Um, <laughs> so send it, our team an email or. Even better, just take a screenshot of this episode and just say you want part two. Here's what I learned in part one. Tag us both on social. Tag us Perfect. both. Brennan King O'Keefe. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes. And then also um, just let us know you want a part two. And then like anything that we missed, just give us your questions. I'll pop up another Q&A box in the future when we do part two. So anything, because of course, you know, we're, we're, we haven't prepared for this. So I'm sure we are going to forget like naturally a lot of things that are part of our everyday life. You know, when you're really close to something, you like forget it's a thing because it's so integrated. So I'm sure there's going to be information where you're going to be like, wait, you guys forgot to explain that or whatever. So we would love to do that for you. You just have to um, tell us exactly what to talk about. Yeah. And the only reason I say no DMs is because I'm really bad at replying to them. So yeah. tagging us on stories is the fastest way for us both to see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great idea and I, we'd love to hear your feedback. So the way we're structured is there's a, there's a million vehicles in the world, but essentially you can think about, um, you know, think mm -hmm. about asset classes. Okay. What are asset classes? Well, there's equities. That means stocks, right? So equities are like, you take ownership in Amazon, you take ownership in Apple, you take ownership in Google, right? Okay. So all those companies are what they call equities or stocks. Now, ETFs are um, a vehicle, if you will, a product that combines a number of things together in a really low fee way so that you can, for example, buy a slice of an is it like ETF. like 500 companies, S&P 500? S&P 500 is an index. An ETF would oh, be see, a I mirror see. of an S&P 500 see, index. even I'm learning, you guys. We're, we're in this together. So uh, there's lots of ways to invest in, in, what, in, in equity exposure. And one of those tools is ETFs, which is primarily what we use. Now, the other side is there's bonds. 
It bonds are super interesting right now. If you follow the news, there's a lot of talk about inflation in the U.S. economy, in the U.S. dollars, a lot of talk about cryptocurrency. There's a lot of talk about bonds. All those things are related, actually, believe it or not. So bonds are actually something that may surprise some of you are part of our portfolio. And there's a very thoughtful reason why, because we have a strategy designed for it. But um, so we have equities, which are your highest growth, highest return oftentimes kind of tools, at least in the previous investment environment. We have bonds, which are fixed income, um, which basically means it's a guarantee to pay you back the amount that you've given plus interest. Essentially, bonds, fixed income are loans. Essentially, they're government-backed loans is really what they are. And then you have things like real estate. A lot of people buy real estate physically and hold on to it. They buy multifamily or they buy their house. That's and that, great. Does it become like officially speaking, when you buy real estate, is it instantly part of your net worth or you have to pay it off for it to be considered part of your net worth? No, it's absolutely not part of your net worth. Okay. And I think your I think your parents had this experience firsthand with one of the older homes. So um, the bank uh, owns the home um, until uh, you, pay you pay it. Right. And here's the crazy thing. Um, someone can quote me on this if I'm misunderstanding, but I'm pretty sure that if you made 80 percent of the payments on a home and then stopped paying on it, the bank would take ownership of the home and not return your 80 percent. So until you pay the full amount, you don't actually take ownership of that asset. Got right. It. That's paying it off. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, when I think about net worth. I usually do not, for example, put in like a car or something, because even though that car does have a value, if I were to offload it or needed to sell it, it's depreciating. And real estate oftentimes has been appreciating, but you're paying it down and don't actually own it. So when I think about net worth, for example, if you bought a home for $400,000, but you just bought it last month and you've only made a few payments on it, um, I my recommendation would be to not consider that net worth to be four hundred thousand, but to consider that net worth to eventually one day be four hundred thousand yeah, or it's like more. Something to look forward to. But mostly focus on my other expo my other gaps. Where can I begin to save money and diversify my risk? Diversify what we're invested in because right now all my money is in my house. So how can I put my money other places besides just my house? Because that's how we diversify risk and how we get the greatest return. Okay. So half the people are like, where the fuck do I even begin? Like we have a ton of scenarios. It's like, what can I do with a thousand dollars a month? Or like, can someone start investing with just $10 or a hundred dollars or whatever? Like I wrote down here, if you have just a hundred dollars to start, um, you know, what would you do with that hundred dollars? Like, let's say in this case scenario, we're going to go into debt, but let's say you have no debt. Like you just have a checking account, a savings account, you don't have, like you have your usual payments, like you have a car payment, house payment, whatever, but you don't have like student loans or credit card debt or anything like that. You have your mortgage, you know, or apartment or whatever. So literally, where do you begin? Like people don't even know. And I think that this is a problem that I had as well. It was such an intimidating world for me. And I forgot to mention that my first event was not the uh, Platinum Partner event. I also went to Wealth Mastery and I also read Tony's books um, and they were so informative. And I just remember being like, why is this not taught in school? This makes absolutely no sense. Why do I have to be at this event to learn all of this? Because I didn't even know. I didn't even know who to talk to or where to begin or like where on the Googles do you go to put in money into investments and what the fuck is an investment and what is a portfolio? So like, where do we begin, Brennan? Yeah. So that's a great <laughs> question. I think the first thing you have to, everyone wants to jump straight to the part where they make money. Everyone wants to jump straight to the part. A lot of, of people like, are like, what's the quickest way to return your money? And way? that's not our no, mindset. You have this to, is for the long game, you guys. You have to start with a roadmap. You have to build a financial plan that is going to grow with you over decades and is going to leave behind it, it, hope, you know, hopefully you can leave something behind should you choose to. Not that you have to, but that should you choose to. The goal is to create something that that grow essentially generational wealth. Generational wealth, right? And so um uh where do you start? I think the most important thing is to start at square one. And that is not where I put my money. What account can I open? The first thing is what are my goals? 
What are my dreams? How do I get there? And those big picture questions are what everyone skips over because someone, their friend made a thousand dollars trading Ethereum or uh-huh. or or, does all the rage or right Dogecoin. Um, and to be honest, um, you know, I, I'm not actually. We'll talk about crypto. We'll talk Don't about get crypto. There yet. We're not, There's a lot no, of questions on crypto. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> and so, but that's that's representative of that, right? You heard from someone who made money fast, and one of the most important investment tools that Catherine and I talk about is like when we invest money, we do not touch it. You cannot afford to put money into investments that you will need for years. Let me say that again. Investing is putting money away that you do not touch for years, years or decades. And years and years. Because the power of investing is compounding. Now, I see this world we're in right now, and there's a lot of traders out there. And what I mean by that is people who are trying to buy low and sell high and profit the difference, and they're very excited by that. And that's amazing. If that's your entry to, into investments, that's incredible because – Getting excited about investments is something I'm fully behind. But unfortunately, the environment that we're in right now, we are awash in money because the United States of America is printing a lot of money. 25% of U.S. dollars, physical U.S. dollars were created in the years 2020 and 2021. 25%, one out of every $4 was created in the last two years. So right now, the world is awash in money, and that's why you see stock markets at all-time highs. It's why you see cryptocurrencies raising, and it's why house prices are through the roof. Uh, People say interest rates, but it's also just money. And the problem that I see is that it's making everyone feel like a genius. And here's the challenge. When the world is awash in money, everything inflates. And when the world is awash in money and everything inflates, everyone looks like a genius. The only people who don't look like a genius are those who didn't take action and put that money somewhere, right? But it's really important to understand the difference between being a trader and being an investor. Being a trader is okay. As a matter of fact, guys, I'm a trader, but I'm only a trader with 5% or less of our net worth. Everything else is unsexy stuff. It's sexy when I think about it and talk with our financial team about it. But it's not fun. I'm he not trading literal... it up and down every day. I'm not trying to make money. I'm not, ooh, it dropped 1%. Let's buy some more. Ooh, it's up 3%. Let me sell. Because I have the high level um, understanding now about things like taxes, about optimization and efficiency. So the square, I bring all of this up. This is a lot of words. Let me simplify it in what we call layman's terms. Okay. What I'm trying to say to you is, is that Listening to advice from others on their journey will never serve you. The only thing that you can control if you're getting started is building a roadmap and being honest about where you are, getting excited about where you're going, and beginning to build a plan around that. God, Brennan, what the hell? Like, that is not helpful. I want to know where to put my money today. No, but it's it's very important, even in my four-step manifestation process, what I teach my students is, like, most people don't even get to step one. They try to get to step four, but they're not even at step one, which is define, decide, and declare what it is that you want. It's the same thing for every single area of your life, and this one is also equally as important. Let me share why. Let's say you have zero debt, right? Because you just finished paying off your debt. Okay, great. That's an, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's amazing. Does that mean that you should put your first thousand dollars in cryptocurrency because it's going to go through the roof? No. Yeah, a lot. A Does lot that, of things with crypto right now are just like fast money. And if you're in the mindset of fast money, you're not ready to invest your money. At, at yes, exactly. The real question I have is, um, we all have seen this different iterations of these statistics, but many people don't have a savings net. Many people don't have an emergency fund. Now, Catherine calls it something I hate different. That word. Don't yeah. ever call it an emergency fund. What do you but call Brennan it? is a little more three D than I am. Um, I just call it an opportunity fund. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I that's call fine. savings account. So, so these things matter because you don't know what's going to pop up. And maybe you have some cash, right? Maybe you have some money that you've saved, but you haven't thought about how much you could need. What if, um, you know, a challenge arose and you needed to just take some time? It may not be something bad like an injury to yourself or like you get fired. What if you need to support a parent? 
Yeah. What if someone gets sick and you need to go, you know, you need to go fly to be with them and help them for, for two months. Someone in our close circle that's just recently happened to. And, you know, I think a lot of people are really inadequately prepared for that. So these are all important questions to ask because your first few thousand dollars that you're investing, maybe you shouldn't be investing. Maybe it should be a buffer that allows you to thrive through any environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally makes sense. And I just want to say, like, when you're doing this, you know, you're not because a lot of people, they save out of fear. Yes. And like, if you save, let me tell you, if you call it an emergency fund, which who cares what you call it, but if you energetically treat it as just in case something happens, I need to prepare for the worst. An if emergency you're doing will find it, you. Of course, that emergency will find you. You will manifest that emergency successfully and you'll yeah. find that savings <laughs> account going back to zero yes. every freaking year. Yes. And that's exhausting. Like that's yes. not what we're here for. But if you enter it from the mentality of, you know, I'm doing this from a place of empowerment. I'm doing this because I love my future self. I'm doing this from a place of being my higher self and just having money to have my back. Completely different energy. Same purpose, completely different energy. Because of course, Brendan and I keep money in the account, you know, enough to pay our team's salary for like, I don't know, however long Brendan decides that. Um, and so we have that, but we're not doing of, oh my God, what if, what if everything runs out by October? We have to have this money. Or no, we are empowered. We're coming from a place of empowerment. We just want to have this money. End of story. It's it's not a place from fear. It's a place from empowerment. It's just the narrative. And I, I, I completely subscribe to that as well. So um, now we've talked about saving. Great. Now here's the second saving account. Your first investment account should be a saving account. And I what I mean by that is a separate saving account. And you can treat that saving account like an investment account. So let's say, for example, your goal, you have your, your safety, your opportunity fund, right? You're like $5,000, that's to the side. And now you wanna invest your first $10,000. My recommendation would be to not immediately jump into, where do I find an investment account? I would say the first step is just to save that money. Save 10,000 and treat it like an investment. Treat it in your brain like it's an investment because then you're gonna reach that number and you're gonna be able to go and place it somewhere and feel very productive. So you recommend people kind of pile up the money before they invest it? My recommendation, personally speaking, is that it's really important. Like, it's all about time, right? So uh, people, I believe humans become very overwhelmed. If you're putting in $50 a week into an investment account, uh, things are moving, you're watching it a lot, you're really getting caught up in it, um, versus really building the traction and confidence that building a, a investment nest egg, it doesn't have to be 10,000 guys. It could be 5,000, it could be 2,500. I'm not a, a, the telling you the amount, but in my opinion, it's helpful because then you're building something already that you're not touching and you're reinforcing that in your circuitry, in your wiring, like, in your brain. This. this is investment money instead of just putting it in. Um, and so then, so if someone had like, if someone want to invest a hundred dollars a week, you would not recommend that you would do lump sums the same way that we do it. I no, that's sorry. That okay. would, I know I clarify I, this because people need the freaking step-by-steps. Well, I know, but people want the step-by-steps to put their hundred dollars a week in an investment account. And there's many things you can do for that. You can use acorns, you can use Robin hood, but I have my feelings about those platforms because they, they, they're question. very marketed towards retail investors like all of us, um, but they don't have great fees. They're, they're, some of their processes aren't super great, as we saw with Robinhood earlier this year with some of the meme stuff. Um, they really rely on the big partners anyway. It's kind of like white labeling Amazon, right? So you, let's say that I sell paper towels and I have Brennan's paper towels, but they're actually stored at Amazon and fulfilled from Amazon and and sold through Amazon. It's basically drop shipping, right? Mm -hmm. That's in some ways, Robinhood is just the interface. Drop shipping investments. (laughs) It's Robinhood, it, uh, it relies on the big time investment partners in the back end to actually fulfill orders and things. And that's where they kind of got into some hot water this year. So my belief is that there's many options available to you. Um, But for me personally, I feel like, um, uh, you know, saving first and then getting excited about that step to transfer that money into an actual investment account 
that will signal in your brain a shift from just simply reallocating money to actually having untouchable money that you are going to grow for decades. That's why mentally I like the idea of building a small, it can be $2,000, guys. It doesn't have to be like $10,000 or $20,000. I was going to say, what do you recommend when people, what threshold for people? I am looking for the consistency of saving with the intention to invest. Because if you don't build that, it's like the yeah. moment the market drops, the moment you become inconsistent in actually investing money, everything falls apart. We're building the habit. And so what you're doing is you're building the habit, the muscle, if you will, you're training the muscle to then go ahead and be an investor. That's why I kind of recommend it that way. Question. Yes. Okay. So let's say that I have 10000 and I'm ready to put it in. Sure. I call, you know, Jason, your buddy, um, your financial buddy. And I say, okay, I'm ready to invest, you know, and he says, welcome to the world of investing. And we drop in 10 grand, um, which a lot of people are going to be like, where's that 10 grand going? What, what are you buying? And all those questions. So please answer those. Um, but then from that point forward, the next time, are you still waiting until you hit another 10,000 in that savings account before you put it in? That's a great tactical question. Because I know we have, I know we have with auto withdrawals into our investment account. And you're also sometimes every now and then, just depending on what's going on in our business, you're like, oh, we have an extra, like this morning, quarter of a million dollars. Let's put it into our investment. So that's like a big lump sum. So we do both. We do everything. I put as much money off the table that we don't spend as possible. As a matter of fact, everything as profit that Manifestation Bay makes after taxes, which is a big caveat here because of taxes on both the business and personal, um, all the profit beyond that and beyond keeping a buffer inside of our business for our employees and our salaries and and costs, um, almost everything gets invested. We don't need a bunch of money in our personal checking accounts to survive. I keep enough to pay rent. I keep enough to pay our bills. Mm-hmm. I keep enough as a little, uh, you know, a little safety buffer, if you will. Uh-huh. Um, everything else is invested. That's how we operate. We do. We operate at, um, uh, you know, on a pretty tight ship because I know the value of putting money away for 10, 15, 20 years. And if we ran into an issue where, you know, we needed more cash on hand, we would find ways to do that, whether it was, you know, just allocating less uh, from a certain months to investments or, or, you know, whatever we decide to do. But um, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my mentality about it. It's just almost all of it gets invested. Um, so to answer your question about the 10,000, yeah. um, you know, or the lump sum, whatever the lump sum or is. the lump sum, I think when you get investing, get started investing, um, one of the best things you can do, I mean, I think creative planning, the firm that we work with, I think they, I do believe they have a minimum amount as do many advisors. Um, I think but their minimum is 50 grand. I think it's so less we work now. with it's less. Well, I, I believe it's I think less we now. work this, this, um, firm works with higher net worth individuals. So that's why they have, so don't freak out being like, Oh my God, I have to reach 50 grand to have like someone who knows what the fuck they're doing with my money. There's all kinds of other options. And if you have anything off the top of your head, like I know that you've even recommended before that people can just open a TD Ameritrade account yeah, TD Ameritrade is perfect. and start investing on your own without any advisor or fiduciary. And then as, and like not wait until you find the perfect person. Cause you might cycle through some people. You might cycle through some companies, of course, eventually find someone who's like a genius and knows what they're doing, but always know what they're doing. Like you're well, no. And even, I'm sorry, just to, just to hop in here really fast, not even know what they're doing you're telling them what to do True. if you're, you're not the boss of your money i i don't tell all due respect jason <laughs> i don't think he's gonna listen to this but no <laughs> one no one does anything with our money unless i tell them to or they approve it to us i'm the owner i'm the manager um i run ideas past them all the time but at the end of the day he doesn't care as much about my money as i do he has other clients he has himself he has he's very knowledgeable he has his own life his own family if you're not asking the questions, taking ownership and being that version of yourself that has everything you want, no one's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I I think it ties back to into like, where do I start? Well, like you'll need to figure out where you start. I'll give you some recommendations right now. Yeah. Like explain it. Cause I know, okay. Can we just talk about how you went to dinner or lunch with, I'm not going to mention names. Um, the guy for that we met platinum partners, 
Um, you met him in LA and he's like a 500 millionaire. So no big deal. Someone totally to listen to for advice. You know, like a lot of people take financial advice from broke people. And I always talk about that. Like you cannot take advice from people like business advice from people who don't have a successful business or financial advice from people who haven't even started investing. It just doesn't make any sense. So I get really excited when it's like, oh, this person's legit. Like this person obviously knows what they're doing. So that's really exciting. And he said, Brennan, if I could go back in time and do it all over again, I would not get into the, um, uh, what did, what did he Private say? equity. Private equities. I wouldn't get into most of this like f- stuff that gets people excited. I would do the most boring, unsexy shit. I would just put my money into index funds ETFs, yeah. and let it fucking sit there for 40, 50 years. Like I would not even touch it. And of course that bores the shit out of everyone. It's the same thing as building a savings account. Really, that's what investing is. Like the way that I see it, it's like you're just putting money Instead of a savings account, it's an account that actually uh, gains money, makes you money, because it depends on what the ROI is, depends on the economy, it depends on a lot of factors, right? Um, But you're literally just what the, the actual action behind it is not that you're like, like, for example, private equity is like you're looking for opportunities in the world and, and people approach you and say, hey, do you want to invest in my company? And there's literally it's the highest risk. And we do that. We also have investments like that, but it's very, very high risk. Index funds are super low risk and they make you money, but it's so boring and unsexy that most people don't want to just do that. But he said, Brendan, I would literally have the same amount of money if I just did that. Because I've obviously lost money in certain investments, I've gained in others, but overall, index funds have the most stability. Yeah. Well, let me, and if I may just clarify that really Please quick. Please clarify. Uh, index funds are not, um, they, they have a lot of volatility and they can be very risky. You can lose money in everything and everywhere. Yeah. It's, but, it's just like life is a risk. You can walk outside and get hit by a bus. Like but, it's, it's all risky, but we're just talking about relative to other things. What Catherine was saying, I think really it was on a long-term time horizon, the risk of investing in an index fund and a diversified index funds is essentially like betting on the world. That's the way I think about it. When you're investing in an index fund, you're not invest. It's like betting on the world versus betting on people, betting on the world versus betting on companies, right? You can get the company wrong. You can get the person wrong. Yeah, this is but not if you like- bet the, on the world in a diversified way and you expect the world to continue to grow and evolve and create value and create opportunities, that's why you invest in things that have a lot of different companies. These are called these diversified index funds. This ETFs. is the S- S&P 500. S&P 500 this is... This is like investing in the top 500 companies at once rather than like just going out and buying Amazon stock. In the US only though, right? Oh, okay. So Yeah, and a lot of people ask if you could also speak on things that would apply outside of the US as well. And just to clarify, like this is US only and this is, you know, other countries. Yeah, so, you know, there's many different ways that you can invest in different countries. I think a lot of times you guys have heard the S&P 500, you've heard of the NASDAQ, you've heard of the Dow Jones, but this is just represented in the United States. So these are places where you would put your money in order to have a an exposure to the growth and success and value creation of the United States. But the world isn't just about the United States, right? So there's similar indices and different ways you can invest in China or in Africa, in Europe. So they have index funds in other countries? Index funds are a vehicle. What the ETF is, is country specific, industry specific. It's a, it opens a can of worms. There are ETFs for everything. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I actually lost a little bit of money. That's why I'm willing to share it with you guys. Uh, I purchased um, an ETF based upon lithium batteries. Uh, and the reason why is because I wanted to get exposure kind of to the EV trend, right? The electric vehicle trend. And it hasn't done great, but I'm still holding on to it because I'm an investor, not a trader, right? Mm. But my my vision is that electric vehicles in the future are going to have a demand for batteries. And so over time, now this is a really risky investment, guys. This is not a great example. This is, do you see how that's niched? It's really niched to just electric vehicles. Whereas my risk is magnified there versus if I put some money in the US in something like the S&P 500, 
Um, one of the ticker symbols that people often reference for the S&P 500 is S is in Sally, P is in Peter, Y is in yes. So SPY is one way you can get exposure to that. Spy. Um, invest in spy. <laughs> uh, or, you know, investing in Europe. Um, uh, there's just so many can ways we that you as can Americans do it. invest in other countries? Yes. Can other countries invest in the U.S.? Yes. The only okay. – here's the interesting question. A lot of people talk about – well, the rules are different internationally. It's true. They are different internationally. Here's the biggest difference. Taxes and vehicles. You can invest anywhere in the world that you want from any country in the world that you want, essentially, right? With some exceptions, but mostly anywhere in the world, you can invest anywhere in the world. The difference that people are really asking is it can I or can't I? It should I or shouldn't I? Mm. And that's where it all comes down to, well, what are the tax rules in your country? And I can't speak to that for a lot of countries. But I know, for example, in Australia, the tax structure is very different. In in Europe, the tax structure is very different. Um, I don't want to get into all of this, but I'll quickly say that in the U.S., capital gains, meaning that the earnings on something you've held for a long time, are very advantageous. That was built as a way to hold on to things for a long time, see uh, your profit, your capital appreciate, and then the benefit of that is less turnover. So instead of buying and selling and buying and selling, people hold on to things, they grow in value, and then they get rewarded with a lesser tax. Other countries don't have as much of that, right? So in a different country, maybe it's not as beneficial to hold as long. Maybe it's more beneficial to have high income things. Maybe they don't appreciate as much, meaning your house going from five hundred thousand to seven hundred thousand. But let's say that five hundred thousand dollar house in Europe is only going to go to five hundred and fifty thousand. However, the income you're going to get from renting it out is two or three times more than the United States. I I'm not telling you what you should do. That's really important to, to, you know, over time, build a network, have someone that you can ask these questions to in a tax capacity, right? Because it's not really about can I, can't I, it's really should I or shouldn't I. And that has to do, again, with taxes, governments, and then the types of vehicles. Like in the U.S., it's a 401k. I'll use Australia as an example. Australia doesn't use 401ks. I believe they're called superannuations. But the point is, is that it's also a retirement vehicle in Australia, so they're similar, but they're different. You can still do many of the same things, but the specific things you do are going to be specific to the country that you live in, the rules that apply, the taxes and whatnot. Okay. I have my income. I have my opportunity fund, which I'm never calling an emergency fund. Okay. Now I have my second savings account. So I reached my nest egg. I have five grand, right? Um, and I don't have a company that I work with. I don't have a fiduciary. And we, of course, recommend fiduciaries, um, not just your financial advisor, but a fiduciary because they're legally obligated to work in your best interest rather than their company's best interest that they work for. Um, so that's just something we learned from the Tony group, all the millionaires, hundred millionaires, billionaires, they obviously recommend fiduciaries. So let's say I have that. Okay. But I'm, I, I don't have the, I don't have the person. So I have the money. I want to start investing. I don't want to wait for the right person, the right fiduciary to come into my life. What do I do? I download an app? No. So what you do is you recognize what is that person going to do for you? That person's going no, no, to help. No, I don't you. have the person yet. I know. No person. I know. And they're not going to show up for a year. That's fine. Okay. But what would that person do for you? They would give you the knowledge and the skill, right? Yes. But let's say, forget the person. Don't even bring them up. What do I do? I really want to invest my money today. What do I do? <laughs> this is so characteristic of our relationship because I'm very long-term thinking and Catherine's very now and both are super integral to our success. But the funny thing is that the reason Manifestation Babe has grown so fast and has, you know, really created a, a high multi seven figure business is because Catherine is insistent on everything. Now, yesterday is, a, is 10 years too late. Whereas like I always say you can, you, I, um, I, I say you can earn millions, but you farm billions. What that means, you can earn the cash flow up front with impatience, with urgency, with necessity, right? But in order to create something beyond that, it's it, a takes, long game. it takes time. How are diamonds created? 
time, heat, and pressure. That's investments too, right? You have to put money in the ground, right? Guess what the heat is and the pressure? The market fluctuations, goes up, goes down, goes up, goes down, have a heart attack, don't have a heart attack. Like that's what the market is. It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. Over time, the, the benefit is we believe that over time, it's gonna go up if you diversify your risk. That's how diamonds are created, right? And what happens after millions of years, someone digs up a diamond and it's gorgeous. It's not even gorgeous until it's polished, right? My point is, is that um, you, you, when you look at investments, it takes time. Um, so Catherine is like, what am I going to do yeah, now? What do I do okay. now? I still want to know. Okay. So the first thing you're going to do now is you're going to go buy two books. One is called Unshakable by Tony Robbins. That's the intro book. If you're ready for the next book, I would love for you to buy Money Master the Game, also by Tony Robbins. I love both of them for one reason. The simplicity built for the average Joe, uh, Janet of America, of the world, wherever you are, it is the basic blueprint of how to win the money game. It is the most basic blueprint of how to win the money game. And I love that about it. But that's not what Catherine's asking. She's asking, nope. what do I do with my money today? So um, I would recommend, um, and again, it's country specific, right? But I would recommend uh, opening an account uh, at a brokerage. Um, that would mean something like TD Ameritrade. That's where we started. And now we use Charles Schwab, right? Charles Schwab, Just yes. because our company transitioned. So it's not like, is yes. one better than another or does not matter? They do the same thing. They Charles Schwab bought TD Ameritrade. They're technically the same okay, thing. There we it's go. the reason why we moved is because of deep, uh, deep details. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so do I, is there like a, a thing in the app in my account where it says index funds, S and P 500 and you add money to it? Yeah. So it's a great question. Um, you're going to have to do some research. I, I love it. This is such a great example. Catherine's trying for me to get, have me tell you guys what to no, do no, and, and give you the I goods. Want, no, I want to make it very specific that I'm not asking you to tell them exactly what to do. I just want to show them that they can start, that it's not this taboo, like hard underground, scary thing that anyone can start with investing in index funds. Have you guys ever like done bill pay through your bank or like paid a credit card bill? Uh, opening they better. <laughs> opening opening a investment account and adding money and buying things is literally it's as like simple as bill. bill pay. It's yeah. it's literally buttons. There's no like you're watching graphs or maybe some of you guys have seen like cryptocurrency charts and like things are going all over the place and it's like red and green and it's jagged. There's none of that. It's so much more simplified than that. So I think if that's what you're getting at, my yeah. dear, um, yeah. is it's incredibly simple to do that. You open an account, you'll transfer in money that will require you to link your bank to that investment account, and then you'll wire in money, at which point you will we'll take that money and you'll essentially create a trade um, where you would buy, you know, um, some securities, meaning some, hopefully some ETFs. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I always would recommend to people to think through the lens of, um, spreading out your risk. So maybe instead don't, if you're new and you only have $2,500, maybe you're not investing in 10 different things, but maybe you're getting something in the U S maybe you're getting something that's called X U S meaning, you invest part of your money in the United States via an ETF and you invest part of your money in the world minus the United States just to get that broad diversification. Um, I am not always the most popular in the methodology because I invest internationally way more than a lot of people. And uh, over the last 20 years, that hasn't looked very good. But investments, you can never look back. You can never past history cannot dictate future performance. You have to always project forward. And so I don't care what real estate did the last 20 years in the United States. I don't care what happened in the US. I don't care what bonds performed. I don't care about any of that. You're putting in the money and you're not taking it out. So it doesn't matter if the market crashes, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes, up, it goes down for the majority of our portfolio. Cause there's certain things that you have sold off or bought, you right. know, bought the dip, sold high. But these like ETFs, these index funds, these like beginner places that are that have the most security, not 
pure security, but the most security, like no matter what happens to the market, you do not pull out your money from there. If I spend a thousand dollars to buy a Japanese maple and I planted it in my garden, and for the first five years, if I chopped it down um, and or, or dug it up and sold it, I would only get two hundred and fifty dollars. But I know that in 20 years, it will appreciate to a mature Japanese maple. And I could sell it if I wanted to for $25,000 or I continue to let it grow and retain its value. That's kind of the same mindset. Any, I love your metaphors. That was a good one. Anytime that you're going to pull up the roots of that plant early, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to diminish the value. But over time, it's going to really grow into something that brings you uh, satisfaction, uh, knowing that you were patient, knowing that you planted your seeds, allowed them to grow. Um, and then, you know, I guess you could use the analogy or the metaphor of watering it as being putting more in, right? I love this. I think we did such a great um, cover of like how to start and showing people that they can start. So I want to go into more like specific sure. questions. Absolutely. You can take as much time um, or as little as you need. And I know we only have like 25 minutes till you have a call. So it shouldn't be too long. Um, let's, okay, let's, let's put in a new scenario. If you have a lot of debt, like, let's say you have, I mean, we can do a couple scenarios. Like, let's say you have 50 grand in student loans. Okay. 10 grand on credit cards. Um, would you recommend someone first pay off the debt and then invest, invest, and then pay off the debt or do it at the same time? Um, everyone's going to have, you know, their own opinions about this. My personal one, I, I really believe that, um, paying down that debt is incredibly important. Um, especially with certain because debt Because the interest is higher than the ROI in most investments, right? That's yeah. what, that's what my reasoning is. So the understanding at a high level would be, um, if you could earn more money investing, then the interest on your debt payments, hypothetically, you could put money to invest and then pay your debt. However, that's extremely risky, right? Because when you get return, it's because of risk. Profit, return on investment is a risk return relationship. The greater the risk, the higher the return. That's the actual nature of investments. It's what everything is built upon. So when you're talking about investing money instead of paying down some of the debts that you have, um, you're really, you're really taking a risk because if those returns don't match the interest on your debt, then you end up in a deeper hole, if that makes sense. Now, let me add one more piece here, which is really important, which is for a lot of people who are either in debt, um, a, a lot of the literature talks about saving and paying down debt. I want to challenge that with one other thing, create more value in the world, find a way to create value in the world. And I'm not saying that you're not creating value. As a matter of fact, we know a teacher who during, uh, you know, during, during COVID uh, exploded uh, by creating a business. She became even, a millionaire. A school teacher became a millionaire because a lot of parents were all of a sudden stuck with their kids. She created like this whole program, this like homeschool program for them. Basically like, you don't want to homeschool your kids. I fucking get it. Not everyone is meant for that. Like I know for sure, I don't want to be our kid's teacher. Like, right. I'm sure I'm going to teach them all the manifestation stuff, but like, I'm not doing your math homework. Sorry. Um, so we're definitely going to hire like, you know, people who can help us with that. I don't know if we're going to homeschool or I don't know. We don't have kids yet. So we're, there's still a lot up in the air. But she was like, oh, I see a problem in the marketplace. There's parents stuck at home with their kids. So let me open up a private school for these kiddos. And she literally became a millionaire she, in 2020. She transitioned her value from a set rate to a market rate. Yes. She said, um, and uh, this is just a teacher. I'm using this as an example. You know, another nurse is a great example. What about a doctor's office? Let's say that, um, you know, a doctor's office uh, during COVID um, maybe all of a sudden had all of the appointments and surgeries cancel, right? Um, well, how can you create value during that space? Maybe you open a drive through COVID test like we had this morning before our, our stuff. You There's know? a doctor's office in Beverly Hills that we used the first time we went to the Maldives just because we didn't know. We had never got tested. We didn't know where to go. And I didn't want to just go to your average drive through because I didn't want to get poked too hard. So we got like a doctor's office to come over. It was like a house call. Oh, my God. It was like $250 per test. And there's three of us plus $450 for the house call. It was like 
1200 $1,300 for a COVID test. Right, but the, but the point is, is that this doctor wasn't getting the business from their core yeah, business. Yeah, no coming to the office. So they found a way to reinvent and add value. And, you know, for us during that time, it was like a super tight window. Yeah. So my point that I'm making on this is that it's not just simply about saving more or paying down your debt. It's about how can I add more value? And it doesn't have to just mean my job or my income. How can I add value to people's lives? How can I add value? Because creating wealth is a reflection of the value created, right? When you own investments, you're buying a slice of things that are creating value for others. But the same is true of yourself. How can I create more value in my life so that it shows up and I have the ability to pay down more debt or I have the ability to invest at a greater rate or I have the ability to go out and pay a down payment for something on like a home that I really want to invest in and still have money to invest as well. So that's, you know, that that's really... Um, the way I look at debt is, yes, you should be paying down your debt. But also don't forget that, like, don't get stuck in the mindset trap that you're limited by the amount that you're currently earning. You're probably not asking yourself, if I was to make 3x what I currently make, what could that look like? How could that look? What would a world look like where I earn three times what I currently earn? What would my life look like? Like, what would work look like? How, how am I interacting? What am I doing? What are my daily steps? And it's not going to come to you immediately. Anyone who's like said affirmations in the mirror knows it's uncomfortable as hell to start. But that's my first step is like, how can I create value so that I can both pay down things faster and grow faster? I think that's really important. Uh, this is more of a quick question. Uh, do you do any day trading? Um. No, I do not do any day trading okay. I, under the way I classify it. Uh, what do you do with dividends when your investments pay you money? Do you, is that considered your income now, your profit, or do you reinvest it? I, we always reinvest it. Um, there's an opportunity to reinvest dividends on most platforms. Um, however, I don't typically use that functionality because certain things will grow faster and be more productive than others. And if you think about it in this context, your winners typically will perform worse than your losers. So even though it's counterintuitive, when you have things that aren't doing as well, it's better to reinvest from some of the winners into some more of the losers. Uh, but tying back into the day trading question, uh, that's not true of day trading. <laughs> that's only true of long term investing, taking money from things that do well and and making sure you're reallocating into things. Okay, while you're talking, I'm going to quickly run to the restroom because I drink way too much matcha during this conversation and I don't want to cut this podcast early. So I'm going to open up a can of worms and you're just going to start and I'll just listen to you from the other room <laughs> and come back and join you. So everyone wants to know your thoughts on cryptocurrency. For the absolute beginner, what is crypto? Because it's such a new thing. It's all the rage. It's all people are talking about. People really want to know what you think of crypto. Do we have any investments in crypto? What is the long term, whatever, with crypto? Like, yeah, just go. What okay. is crypto? What are your thoughts? Oh, uh, she knows she opened Pandora's box right now. Um, okay, so cryptocurrency um, is. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, how do I explain for beginners? Um, crypto is. Um, essentially a process of um, using a blockchain, um, which is a, a chunking or blocks of transactions that are being vetted um, in the most basic sense. Um, now, there's a million different manifestations of like how that actually works. But basically, it's a bunch of things that exist on computers and Basically, math and problem solving, computer, computers are running to solve these things um, that allows these transactions to be verified. I think that's a relatively, there's a, there's a million more ways. I, I can link something below probably as well. Um, cryptocurrency is a big thing right now. Um, yes, we are invested in cryptocurrency. Yes, um, we have not been invested in cryptocurrency. As a matter of fact, um, in 2017, Wait, you when just said yes, we do, and no, we don't. I said yes, we have not been. We are invested, and we also have not been at other times. Okay, that makes yes. sense. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, crypto, in my opinion, uh, gets confused with blockchain. 
Um, mm. And without getting too deep into these things, um, a lot of people really want to trumpet and herald that cryptocurrency is forever and will be here forever. Um, while my personal belief is I do believe cryptocurrency is here to stay, I, I believe the more accurate way to describe that is that blockchain is the technology that will change the world forever. Blockchain is never going anywhere. Cryptocurrencies will come and they will go. Do you know there's been over 3,000? I, I want to I have to check the, the actual number, but there's like a mind boggling amount of currencies in just human history, just recorded history. We think it's like, you know, the yen and the dollar and, and the euro and like, but there have been so many currencies. Cryptocurrencies are very similar. Many of them are going to come. Many of them are going to go. Some um, will probably eventually hang around. And one of a really smart investor um, who was very negative on some crypto and now actually is more bullish on some some crypto bullish, meaning um, like positive uh in the short term and the midterm optimistic about optimistic it, yeah. about it. Um, uh, it said it really well he said you know i'm invested in a few of these things but the reality is in my opinion is that probably the thing that wins is still being invented by some kid in his harvard or her harvard dorm room um why do i resonate with that uh just think back to aol just think back to MySpace, right? These were the first market entrants, right? Uh, AOL was a big deal back in the time. Like it, Google, Google, Google was, I think, the sixth internet provider, uh, the, the, the sixth um, uh, search engine provider uh, that came to. And like, it's clear who won these days, right? Google's everywhere, totally. right? Um, you know, Facebook, I used to have an account back when you had to have a college uh, email to get in uh, before it expanded everywhere. Um, but before that, it was MySpace. MySpace is barely around anymore, right? So I use those examples because everyone really likes to feel confident about what the future holds for cryptocurrency, and no one knows. Anyone who says that they know, I would definitely tell you to think about what benefit they have about them thinking that they're right. There's a lot of people who have most of their investments into crypto right now. Mm -hmm. Can you like kind of speak on that? Like, what would you say if, because why not invest in crypto, right? Like why not? But it cannot be the majority of your portfolio with how risky it is. Would you agree? I, for those of you who know uh, that Catherine and I love Las Vegas, I don't need to say any more, but I love Las Vegas and I love to gamble actually, believe it or not. And um, he's I, won $19,000 on a slot machine in a single spin at like two in the morning. And my best friend from the other room ran screaming her head off. And I'm like, oh my God, something bad happened. Cause like, why else would you scream your head off at two in the morning? She's like, Catherine, you're husband won $19,000. I'm like, what? And I look at my phone and literally it was like two minutes after I stopped looking at my phone because I was going to bed and I just see a selfie of Brennan and uh, on the screen it says, please, you know, call an attendant to claim your $19,000. <laughs> so yeah, he loves to gamble. Okay. So roulette is a game where they spin a wheel with a ball and it lands on different numbers. And so people go and they place chips on this board. That's what I liken the cryptocurrency space to right now. It's gambling. Straight up, it's gambling. It is a gamble. Everyone that's investing in all these things it's is It's like really, taking all your investment money and going to Vegas. It's going to Vegas and people don't realize- Which you can win really big, but you can also win nothing at all. And people have so won that's really just, big. That's just the risk that you're taking, at least with, with this avenue. And all investments are risky. Again, life is risky. It's a part of life, right? You're, we're always taking risks. It's just that at this time, this time in 2021, this is this is the opinion that we have. This is the advice that we have. It can change in a couple of years. You never know. Well, it changes all the time. And like I said, I'm actually very bullish um, in many ways on cryptocurrency and the crypto space and blockchain. Um, and we are invested in this space. But, um, you know, every day when I see telegram groups or swipe ups or people claiming to be, you know, crypto coaches, well, it's pretty easy to be uh, uh, making money when everything's going up. But the problem is, is that when things go down, no one understands the ferocity with which they can deplete your money to zero. 
when we were at the financial trip, I remember um, Bitcoin just crashed. It was like the first big crash of Bitcoin. I think it was at 18,000 and then it crashed down to like seven or something. I don't no, know. it crashed all like, wait, like I think 2,000. Okay, so it was a big crash and Tony was really like grilling into everyone who had money in crypto. Like, hey, you don't want it to be the majority of your portfolio. They recommended a percentage at that event. I don't remember what it was. And I'm just curious, does is that does that still stand today? And what what is your general, just your opinion? Again, you guys, Brendan's no professional, but your opinion, what would you recommend for people's for percentage of that nest egg of like five thousand dollars? How much should they put into crypto? It really depends on on the level of investing and the level of risk that you're willing to take. I would say um, my personal belief is that I think everyone should have a extremely minuscule portion of their net worth in crypto. Let me reiterate that. Do not tweet that Brennan said you should put all your money in crypto in extremely minuscule portion. That means 1%. Mm -hmm. If you've got a thousand dollar net worth, that literally means $10. If you've got a $10,000 net worth, right? That means $100, right? I'm talking extremely small. Now, if you have a larger net worth, you can begin to change that, right? You can begin to change that a little bit, but you need to understand everything you invest in crypto, you can 1000% lose everything. And people seem to think that because of the success of Bitcoin and Ether, both are which, if you're to invest in the crypto space right now, those would be the two, those the are two. those are the two, those are the two horses that are racing at the Kentucky Derby. Okay. And that doesn't, but this is an important point. It does not mean that they cannot be unseated by something new, right? So there's always risk everywhere. Nothing is certain. And that's really important in this space. That being said, um, I do believe cryptocurrency is something that will be in the future. And I do believe that there's a lot of return to be had. And I definitely encourage people to, to learn about it. And the, one of the best ways is just to watch stuff on YouTube. That's how I learned a lot about it. I still don't understand everything. Um, I, I, explaining things is still hard. I have an intuitive understanding of how it works, but I'm no expert. Um, but you know, we, we do use, we do use Coinbase and we do have uh, cold wallets uh, as well, which means that we can take those, those uh, cryptocurrencies off of exchanges and actually hold the keys ourselves. Um, and uh, that is a part of our, of our, um, our extreme risk bucket in our investments, in our net worth, uh, as well as investing in some private companies that we've invested in. I, I invested in one of my, uh, my college friends, uh, coconut water companies. That's that I, been so much fun for me personally. Again, these are pure risk investments because again, you're betting on an individual like Brennan's best friend from college to approach him and be like, Hey, you want to put, I don't know what it was, 35 grand into my coconut water company. Like you are literally betting on him to have his shit together, to grow the company, to build the business. So you're really out of control and you're putting your money, like that chunk of money on just that one single person. But the cool shit is, is that when he sells that company, if it's worth billions of dollars, that share grows to a really large portion. You get a nice cash out that's way higher than what you put in. But there's like no guarantees on the timing of that. If that ever happens, there's it's, a risk. it's he pure would even risk. Say, he would, even my friend would say, he knows things can fail. Every, every investor understands what human psychology is a major portion of investing, right? Humans, it's like everything. Humans know, humans know to buy low and sell high. Guess what most humans do? Sell low and buy high. Yep. They sell from fear. They, they sell buy from, from fear, fear. They buy from fear. Exactly. And, and, you know, timing is everything. The right decision at the wrong time is the wrong decision. You know, um, there's a great scene in the big short, which has a movie about what happened in the housing crisis in 2000, 2008, 2009. Um, and there's a part where uh, Christian Bale, who's playing Michael Beery, <laughs> who's a, a real guy, uh, is marking on his board minus, 16 million minus 20 million every day because his fund is losing so much money because they bet the house on the housing market crashing right he's losing money every single day and then one day the light switch goes on and he made so much money for his investors because he was betting basically against the banks being idiots um my point is is that you can timing also really matters so why do we talk about timing in investing 
you will choose the wrong time to invest in anything. Let me say that again. You will choose the wrong time to invest in anything. Always. You will always do it. You will never be the smartest person that chooses the right time at the bottom. That's why it's so important to just get started and to start buying chunks at consistent intervals to build momentum because that way you have the opportunity to buy things when they go down, but you don't sit and wait for the perfect opportunity because that perfect opportunity will never come. It will actually come, but you'll look at it and you'll say, mm, that's nice. Think there's something better. It's 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 uh, it's personified in Tinder, right? Fear of missing out, right? People swipe on great people because they want something different. Same thing happens in investments. That's why it's so important to get started. And that's also why, guys, I recommend just starting with that little bubble, that little that little net worth bubble, to then transition to move it. Because having that consistency is everything. Because you are gonna, as much as you tell anyone that you're gonna definitely buy everything when it crashes and you're going to sell everything when it's high, I would bet money on the, on the fact that you're probably going to sell towards the bottom and you're going to buy when things start to have momentum because you feel like, oh my God, everyone's doing this. It's going to succeed. When everyone's that's the doing top. something, it's usually something you want to run away from. Usually. Not always, but it's like, my, that's my life rule as well is Look at what everyone is doing and do the exact opposite. Yeah. Um, I have, I know there's going to be a part two because I mean, there's so many questions. So once again, let us know if you want a part two, what you want to be in part two. We're definitely open to your questions, but I do have one final question to ask, which is just a fun little question. Do you use your intuition to invest? Absolutely. I know you do research. Brennan only goes and reads the news because of, um, you know, trends. He looks at trends of what's going on in the world. Um, But besides that, do you use your intuition? Absolutely. Look at that. Um, Okay. Well, I think that is it. Thank you so much for submitting your question. Thank you, Brennan, so much for being here. This was so much fun. I got to relearn a lot of things and it was really exciting. Um, definitely we will link some resources for you. So those two books that Brennan mentioned, we'll link the company that we work with. Again, that company has a higher nest egg start to begin. When we started with them, it was 50 K. I remember that. So we were in a position to invest 50 K right off the bat. Some of you aren't, and that's okay. And again, that's why I really grilled Brennan on like, what if you don't have a company to work with yet? What if you haven't found that person? Just knowing that you can start today. Um, and then of course, thank you so much for sharing your, you know, advice for anyone who has debt because now they have an action plan. So remember, have a goal and then begin your action plan and actually commit to it because so many people have plans in their heads for the rest of their lives and they never actually take action on the plan. So don't be one of those people. Um, so we'll link all of that. And then please, please, please take a screenshot of this episode right now. Tag me at manifestation, babe. Tag Brennan, which is at Brennan King O'Keefe. I will, whoops, I will also tag, um, I'll also share that in the show notes as well, link to his Instagram so you know how to spell it. Um, and then let us know what your biggest aha moment was, takeaway. Definitely recommend sharing this information and knowledge with people. You know, it's not necessarily a part of, you know, the Manifestation Bay brand of like how to invest, though we do talk about money. We do talk about, you know, building wealth. And most of the time I talk about it from an energetic standpoint, but it's really nice to have this as like a way to balance things out. And we know that this isn't, this is information that like we, we just don't learn on a daily basis from the average places, right? So we would definitely appreciate if you could um, share this episode with anyone that you think could benefit from it and uh, leave a review for the podcast if you haven't yet. And if you haven't yet, when you leave a review, take a screenshot of it, send it to hello at manifestationbabe.com before you submit it. So take that screenshot, then push submit, and then email it to hello at manifestationbabe.com and we will send you a free manifestation hypnosis. Um, and I think that's it. Any, any last thoughts, Brennan? If this stuff has resonated with you in any way, also, um, I include a much more in-depth dive of this inside of MBA, which is the Manifestation Bib Academy. Yes. Brand the, 
How did I forget that? Yes. Brendan has an investment course inside. So it's, it's everything you learned today, but going deeper and deeper and deeper um, and expanding more on a lot of things, of course, which is um, included absolutely free of charge inside of the Manifestation Babe Academy because, you know, Brendan and I are kind of a partner deal. So of course we're going to come together. Um, and yeah, so if you haven't signed up for MBA yet, you can get on the wait list at manifestationbabeacademy.com. And that launches in August of 2021, which we're so excited about. All right. Thanks so much for being here, babe. I love you so much. Thank you too, beautiful. Love you too. All right. I'll see you guys in the next episode. Mwah. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. If you absolutely loved what you heard today, be sure to share it with me by leaving a review on iTunes so that I can keep the good stuff coming your way. If you aren't already following me on social media, come soak up the extra inspiration on Instagram by following at Manifestation Babe or visiting my website at manifestationbabe.com. I love and adore you so much and can't wait to connect with you in the next episode. In the meantime, go out there and manifest some magic.